chapter. And so if you have your Bibles, grab those and turn to the New Testament book of James this morning. The New Testament book of James. Exciting, exciting day as we open up a brand new book of the Bible. If you are new to Calvary Chapel or perhaps visiting today, uh, we here at, at Calvary Chapel, we like to study the Bible, as any church should be about doing. But we study the Bible chapter by chapter, verse by verse, in an expositional style. And we seek to do that so as to gain really a concept of the whole, a grasp of the whole counsel of God, so that we know how to serve the Lord in this world that He's put us in. And today is a great day to be here because we are, are starting a brand new new study in the book of James. We'll be in it for about the next 12 weeks as we move and make our way on these Sunday mornings through this book. And uh, if you're taking notes today, the simple title for this message is Count It All Joy. Count It All Joy. And that is what exactly we're going to see James exhorting us to as we move through our text today. But to get us started, I just want to read the first verse, this short greeting of James. And then I want to pray one more time before we get into our Bible study. And then we will move forward and see what God has for us. So if you're there, James chapter 1, verse 1, it's nice and simple. He says, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. Nice and simple. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this day. And God, I just thank you so much for just... Lord, the invitation, indeed, as Jordan was saying, Lord, when, when you died on the cross, Jesus, you tore the veil. Lord, we have open access to you, and we have an invitation, Lord, from you to run boldly to you, God. I just thank you for that right now. And I thank you that, God, we can do that in worship with our voices and with song, and God, too, we can and are invited to do so with the worship as we study your word. And so, God, I, I pray that right now, as we open up the Bibles, Lord, our Bibles to this new book, and, Lord, we start this study, that you would just meet us here that you would be with us, and that, God, you would direct our time, Lord, here today, and as we seek to study your word anytime. And, Lord, I'm so thankful that as I ask for your help, Lord, as we ask for your help to hear your word and to know your word, that, God, we can ask that expectantly, because, Lord, you tell us that the Holy Spirit is given to us to be our helper, and that, Lord, to teach us your truth and to teach us the deep things of you, God. And so, God, we ask for your help right now. We ask that you truly would just be the teacher here in this time, and that we would grow in our knowledge of you and our knowledge of your word so that we can serve you in this world. And we pray this now, again, expectantly, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, indeed, any time that we start a new book together, it does us well to gain some insight and some background on that book, looking at the author, the date it was written, looking at the audience that it was written to, as well as the breakdown of the book and the themes that we find within it. And all of these things, as we study them, as we look to them, they help us to really contextualize within the biblical narrative, within history, and within our own lives, what the Bible is saying to us and how we as God's people are called to see the Bible speaking to us and how God wants to lead us through his word, which is exactly why the word is given to us. We know that the Bible is God's word given to us that is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so that's why we study the Bible and why it's important that we even study and know what we're reading and about what we're reading so as to see more of the truth within. And so as we look at the background of the theme, the breakdown of the book, it does us well to do so, and it all is worth it. And so we start with the background and theme. And what I'd like to start with first is, is with the author. The author of the book of James was a man simply, as we see within the greeting, by the, by, by the name of James. And again, it's not hard to see that. However, there are several men within the New Testament who were named James, four, in fact, that we take note of. But however, the James that makes the most sense to have written the book of James is a man by the name of James who happened to be the half-brother of Jesus. You see, this is the same James that is mentioned in Matthew chapter 13, verse 55, or in Mark chapter 6, verse 3. He would also be considered one of those unbelieving brothers that we see mentioned in John's gospel. In John chapter 7 verse 5, as Jesus was there waiting and not intending necessarily to go yet to a feast in Jerusalem, his brothers taunted him there. And we aren't given their names at that time, but we know from the rest of the Bible that James, he would have been there and he would have been unbelieving at the time. 
Also, he is the same James that is mentioned in Jude's book. Jude has a short book right before the last book of the Bible, Jude, named after himself. And in Jude 1.1, he says, Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. He was also a half-brother of Jesus, as is James. And this James, again, while Jesus was living, was not a believer in his brother. And one could possibly see that. Perhaps some resentment was there. I mean, you grow up with Jesus, you grow up with a perfect brother, there would possibly be some resentment. He doesn't do anything wrong. You get busted for everything. I wouldn't believe in him either. However, what we know is from Paul's writing and from the book of Acts, James, well, he becomes a believer in Jesus after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And in the time between his resurrection and his ascension, James, well, he gets saved. And we see Paul write about that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul outlines Jesus' time before his ascension and how Jesus moved about the country, speaking to various people, teaching his disciples of what they could expect after he went to his father. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 7, he speaks there specifically of James and how Jesus appeared to him, which is at that time when many believed that James's faith went from being an unbeliever in his brother to a believer in his Savior. And so from clues within scripture, as well as church tradition and history that goes all the way back to the earliest the earliest writings of the church, James, the half-blood brother of Jesus, is the best candidate for this book. And that's a really good thing to make note of, as well as the fact that he greets his readers in the way that he does. You notice there that he says, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. James is unlike, I would venture to guess, many of us who would want to try to get someone's attention that we're writing to, right? Like, if we were seeking to gain an audience, what, what is often a practice is to name drop. And James, well, he could name drop with the best of them. He's got the best name drop in the world. He could have easily said, James, the half-blood brother of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, the Word of God became flesh, the one who was at the beginning with God. Hey, I'm, I, I'm his brother. Listen up. He very easily could have done that, but he didn't. What he did is he writes James, a bondservant. That Greek word is the word doulos. And it is the Greek word that simply means slave and one who is enslaved or who is willingly enslaved to their master and subject to their will completely. James takes the place of a humble servant of the Lord who happens to be his brother and their rights in a way doesn't name drop, but simply says, hey, you know what? I'm a servant along with you and I'm writing as a fellow servant of the Lord to you. It's an amazing thing that he does worth taking note of. And so with the author known as James, the brother of Jesus, we then look to the date that is written as well as the audience because they go hand in hand. And the book of James was written between 45 and 50 AD, which would have made it one of the earliest, if not the earliest book in the New Testament. And the audience that he addresses, well, it really helps to solidify that. Because you see, he writes in his greeting that he's writing to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. This phrase, 12 tribes, is of course a reference to those who would be of Jewish descent, which would make sense as he's writing there in the early stages of the church because the early church was predominantly made up of Jews. And that came, we know, from the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 2, you'll remember there at Pentecost, how there were many that were gathered there in Jerusalem to celebrate that feast. And as they were, the followers of Jesus were praying and seeking the Lord. And what happened? The Holy Spirit came. The Holy Spirit came and baptized there many who knew Jesus. And Peter, full of the Holy Spirit, he gets up, he preaches a sermon, and we see thousands get saved. The church exploded within a sermon. And what happened after that is all of these who were saved, well, they didn't live in Jerusalem. They went back home. Some went to Crete, some went all over other parts of, uh, of, of Israel and all over the, th that area. And as they went, so too did they go back to a life where they were expected to live as they had before. They went and instead of living though as Jews in the land that they were, well, they live now as believers in Christ. And that would have been met with opposition. That would have been met with issues. That would have been met with persecution and trials that come along with that, as well as a need for instruction on how to live now in Jesus, no longer following 
the yoke or being under the yoke of the law. And so that is who James is writing to. He's writing to these new Christians, these new Jewish believers who are now needing to know how to live life with the Lord. And as he writes there to them, he addresses them in the early stages of the church being formed. So James is the author. He's writing to Jewish believers in the early stages of the church. But now that we know that, we then move to the breakdown and the themes within the book so as to know what we're getting ourselves into. And really with the book of James, if you've read it before, you realize that almost every single verse is a section unto itself, a lesson unto himself. In fact, if I was to break down this book into all of the sections that we could, there would be a lot of them. Your, your note page would be extra long. And so the best way to break this book up is really to see, well, how many verses are in it? And there's 108 verses within this short book. And taking it further than that, within those 108 verses, there are 54 imperative verbs, charges there from the author to live differently, to live practically as a result of having faith in Jesus Christ, which is really our overarching theme of this book, practical faith. Practical faith, living out our life with Jesus Christ, living out our faith with Jesus. In this book, James will speak on topics of life that all Christians encounter. And I'm quite thankful for that. I'm thankful that James is so practical in his writing that we have the book of James to be able to see, hey, how does daily Christian life, how does it play out? Because oftentimes what we do, and appropriately so, we equate our Christian life to the spiritual things, which we should, because our Christian life is spiritual. It's supernatural. The change that Jesus does in our life, it's a supernatural change. To be there now justified in Jesus Christ, to have the imputed righteousness of Jesus upon us so that God, when he looks at us, no longer sees a sinner, but sees saved, that's supernatural. I don't fully understand that, but I know that it's real, and that's amazing. But what we can do sometimes is we can only stick with the spiritual, only stick with even make it ethereal, if you will, and we forget that God is also about the practical things of life. And the Bible speaks to us on the practical things of life. And that is what we see within the book of James. The topics covered within the book of James include so many things that we encounter daily. Things like trials. We're going to be looking at that, at that today. A temptation, where temptation comes from, where it doesn't come from, how to navigate it. The tongue, many of us have an issue with that. And so James is going to teach us to shut our mouth, which is great because we need to know that. Time management and awareness, togetherness, true religion. James is going to talk about that as well, trusting God. And there's other topics as well. I just quite frankly ran out of T words, so I stopped there. But anyways, the book of James is all about living out life practically with Jesus, about living practical faith and being, as James is going to exhort in chapter one, doers of the word and not hearers only. The book of James is amazing for us because it shows us how to live with the Lord, how to live out our faith practically with him in the day to day. And that's an amazing thing for us to take hold of because we're called to live for the Lord in the day to day so that the world around us sees the Lord in our lives day to day and so would desire to follow him as well. So that is what we can expect from the book of James. That is what we can expect to see. And I pray that we would pray to see and pray to walk out as we move through this book. And to start us off, James is going to begin by their launching and giving his first exhortation here in verses two through four, which is all we're going to cover today because that's pretty much all that we can handle quite honestly, because he comes out swinging and he comes out swinging here with this really irrational call, you could say, or it seems irrational as he gives it. So let's pick up in verse two. Let's read our text for the day, and then let's unpack it together. Where he says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Again, James comes out of the gate swinging. He seeks to lose popularity rather quickly with his first imperative here, calling the readers to count it all joy when they fall into various trials. And you remember that he is writing to those who have dispersed around the land from being saved at Pentecost, perhaps, and are now facing opposition, facing and walking in trials where they live. And he's writing to them. And the first thing that this guy says to them is, hey, what you're going through, 
count it all joy as you fall into various trials. And I quite frankly think this is the best way that James could open up his book. I think it's the best way that he could because as he opens up this book, it's not just appropriate for the reader, but it's also indicative of the fact that James, that he's going to be honest, that he's going to be honest with the reader about what living for the Lord looks like. And we should take that to heart, that the Bible is honest with us about what it looks like to live for the Lord. And it's not always warm and fuzzy. You know, we love, you know, Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. We, we do know that from the Bible and I'm thankful for that. And that's warm and fuzzy. I like that. I like that Jesus loves me and that he holds me and he has me. He'll never leave me. In fact, we're going to talk about the day. That's warm and fuzzy. Trials, not warm and fuzzy. Not warm and fuzzy at all. But yet, just as true. Just as true and just as honest of James to speak about that in the same way he's going to speak about all of the other things that he will. And I'm thankful that coming out of the gate, James is honest about what's ahead. And he's honest about what it's like to live for the Lord. And he gives us, you could even say, a promise to start it off. And he does start with this promise. And we've mentioned this before as James establishes, reinforces it here. That as a believer, we aren't immune, and he points out here, to trials, to hard things coming our way. And perhaps the same thought process was present in his day as it is in our day. That if you give your life to the Lord, if you seek to follow Jesus and you surrender to him, that all of a sudden your life becomes carefree, that all of a sudden all of your problems just go away and you have nothing to come against you. And I've got to say that nothing, nothing could be farther from the truth. Because even as you believe in Jesus, well, we still live in a world that is hard, that is fallen, where trials will come. And trials come to you before you're in Christ, so they're definitely going to continue to come to you after you're in Christ. Notice that James doesn't say, count it all joy if or should you fall into various trials. But when you fall into various trials, when they come upon you, he says, count it all joy. And he's giving a promise there in saying that, that, hey, guess what? This isn't something for you just to think, ah, it might not happen to me. No, it's going to happen to you. And here's how you navigate it. Here's how you navigate this life with the Lord. And he starts off by saying, here's how you navigate it when it gets hard. And he does so after giving this promise really wrapped up within this exhortation that trials and hard things will come. He then gives a position to the reader to know how to handle and to look forward to what can happen afterwards. You see, as James gives the promise of trials being inevitable, he also gives along with them this position that we and the reader are to take. And more importantly, that we have the ability to take. You see, he exhorts there to count it joy. And as he does, understand that J James here isn't giving the reader or calling the reader to just blindly just walk in happiness or walk in like this smiling fake church face idea that, hey, you know, the Bible says count it all joy. So no matter how hard it is, I just have to put a smile on. No, James is nowhere negating the heart as the Bible nowhere negates the heart. But what he is doing is giving insight into the reality that as a believer in Christ, when trials come, you can and should count it all joy. Much like the Apostle Paul, who writes later in Philippians, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, where he says, rejoice always. And again, I say rejoice. Or in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, where he simply says as he's closing out that letter, hey, rejoice always. It's very short, simple verse, easy to memorize. He's doing so as James is here, saying that the believer can from a position of belonging to Jesus. Saying that they can because of the position that they hold in the Lord. And so James here as he exhorts to count it all joy, he does so showing that when the believer falls into various trials, they can count it all joy because positionally they are in Jesus. And there is no doubt the book of James, understand, is going to strike a nerve with all of us as we study it. Somehow, some way, this book will get you. It's probably already gotten 100% of us in the room at this point in time. If it hasn't, it'll get you when he talks about the tongue, I promise. And it's important that the promises that James has already given, the position that he is laying out for us, become a reality to us. And what I mean is as we open up, as James comes out swinging and says, count it all joy, brethren, when you fall into various trials, we need to realize again, the honesty of the word of God, the honesty that says, hey, trials are real. Trials are inevitable. You're going to walk through them. And positionally, you can be joyful in them because you're in Christ. 
And we have to get that on the onset. We have to understand that James here is writing to believers. He's writing to those who know Jesus and who positionally are walking and playing out their faith practically in this world. And James, again, is it blindly telling the reader or us to put on a smile and pretend everything's okay, but to count it all joy because, again, positionally, we can be joyful in trials because we are in Christ, because simply Christ is with you, because simply God is with you. And and that is something that is so simple, so simple that it's almost silly to say it, so simple that when someone says it to us, we're like, ah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, God's always with me. He's everywhere. He's omnipresent. Yeah, you're right. But we need to understand that today, that that's a reality. Maybe a fresh reality to you today and a fresh reminder is necessary to say to you today that, hey, God loves you and God is with you no matter what you are facing. That's an important thing for us to realize is a true statement. It's not a cliche thing that we say. It is absolutely true. And understand that James is writing to his audience so as to establish, hey, trials are inevitable, but Joy is possible because God is with you. And it's the same thing for us. Today, understand God is with you. Understand today that no matter what you are facing, no matter what you are in, and we will talk more about that in a second, no matter what it is that God, he is with you in it. If you are in Christ, Christ is with you and he won't leave you. We have that promise from Jesus as he was there going away from his disciples in Matthew chapter 28. He says, lo, I am with you always until the end of the age. Amen. And that is a truth from the word of God that is for them and for us. And so they believe that reality that God is with you. If you are positionally in Christ today, meaning you have a relationship with him, then you have a reason, you have an ability and a foundation upon which to count it all joy in trials because in whatever you're facing, whatever you're walking through, God's with you and he won't leave you. And knowing that helps to move us further. It helps James to move the text further and to show what's on the other side of the trials. And I love this because what he does is he gives a promise. It's a hard, honest promise, but it's a promise nonetheless that trials are inevitable. He gives a position to stand in to show that, hey, you can have joy within that. And then he follows that up with another promise. That there is this call to count it all joy, which we positionally can. And then on the other side of the trials, well, there's something that God has for us. There's a promise of something else. James says, knowing that the testing of your faith, it produces patience. He says, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. There is the promise of trials that we positionally rejoice in in Christ, which is important for us to do because as we go through the trial, again, there is something produced on the outside of us. And James lets us know what that is. He says it's patience. And that word patience is not what you would equate it to or think in our modern day. It's not this idea of like patiently waiting for something or just like growing and being able to wait like at the doctor's office or at the restaurant for your food to come. That's not the patience that James is alluding to here. The Greek word that is there is the Greek word hupomone. It's a wonderful word. And it could be translated, perhaps some of your Bibles, if you're reading out of a different translation, perhaps it translates it differently. It could be translated steadfastness. It could be translated endurance or perseverance. One commentator that I read said that it could be equated to spiritual toughness. And I really like that one because I'm not an overly tough guy. And so the idea of being spiritually tough, that, 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 that pleases me. So anyways, I, I love that James is honest again, about how trials are existent, how they are inevitable. And he's honest about what we can gain after them. What's on the other side of them? James is not telling us to count it all joy, just to let our faith be tested just because it's going to happen. So we better just deal with it. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying, hey, count it joy because I said so. He's not saying count it all joy because, hey, this is just going to happen to you and you just got to endure it and patiently wait it out so you can learn how to wait. No, he's saying as you do so, you will see within you a resilience, a toughness, an endurance, a maturity that is built up in your life to grow us in our relationship with the Lord and to grow us up as people in the Lord. Which is why James says again there, but let patience have its perfect work, meaning the production of your patience, let it happen that you may be perfect, complete, lacking nothing. See, he knew, as many of us know, that God wants to grow his people. That God wants to grow his people as he uses his people. 
And there is a way that that growth can happen. And growth, it oftentimes hurts. Growth oftentimes is hard. It often comes not through ease, not through just moving along easily, but it comes with hardship. And so James is honest with the inevitability, the coming of trials that will be allowed into the believer's life that as joy is able to be had within those positionally in Christ, on the outside of that, because of the testing, there will be fruit, there will be growth. And as he wrote it to them, and it was, it was relevant to their life, it's no different for us sitting here today, receiving the same exhortation from the book of James. A promise again of trials being real in our lives. I don't have to tell you that. We live in a hard world that's fallen that we know from Romans chapter 8 is groaning always for the redemption of this world. We realize that. We know that. Trials are a reality. We can't go around the room today and speak about the trials and try to relate because quite honestly, so many trials are, are as unique as we are. And it would take all day for us to talk about what we've been through, what we're going through, what we're about to go through, because that's where you're at. You're either in it, out of it, or going into it, or they're all one together. I, I don't really know. I just know that this life is hard. And this life is hard on purpose because as we grow in the Lord through the hard, the Lord uses that growth to help us walk forward and show him in this world. And James here, what he's doing is he's giving us this honest insight into what life with Jesus is going to look like. It's going to be hard. Awesome. But you can have joy in it because of who you are in Jesus. And on the outside of that, on the other side of that, there is growth in the Lord and an ability to be used differently by the Lord. There's a maturity, a toughness, a steadfastness, a perseverance that is cultivated within the trial. And James here is being honest that that is what is available. That that is what is there to happen. And it's amazing that if we have the promise, what we need to do is if we have the promise of trials coming and we have this position made known to us of being able to join the Lord, then what is left for us to look at is say, okay, well, if it's going to happen and we can have joy, then we should press into the Lord and see what he has. And that's counterintuitive to us because we don't like to be uncomfortable. We don't like pain. We don't like discomfort. But yet what we see here is that that is going to happen. And we have a choice, we have an option on whether or not we allow the Lord to lead us and grow us or to just sit and not see the growth and not see the Lord move and work. And James starts his book like this. Welcome to the book of James. It's going to be awesome, I promise. And he's honest on the outset. He's honest here and he's honest about what the Christian life will hold and what the Christian can stand on and who we can stand in and what we can expect. And something about the book of James that we've already mentioned, but we're going to flesh out a bit. And this is true for all of it. Really, it's true for all of the Bible, but it's true, especially for James, is that within the book of James, all of these exhortations, all 54 of them, they all come with a choice. They all come with a choice. And today the choice is, as we look here at trials, and I love that he gets this one out there first and he's going to continue to talk about it, is there is a choice to hear these exhortations all throughout the Bible, all throughout the book of James, and say, yes, I'm going to lean into the Lord. Yes, I'm going to lean into what he has and how he wants to lead my life, or I'm not. And it is as simple as that, friends. It is as simple. There's no middle ground, really, when it comes to James. James doesn't give this, like, middle ground. Really, the Bible doesn't give a middle ground. You're following Jesus or you're following the world. There's, there's, there's no sitting in two camps. And James, man, he hits that perfectly. Where every exhortation that he is going to give today, every exhortation throughout the book is going to provide a choice to either be a doer of the word or a hearer only. And in doing so, James issues a choice and issues also, too, a path that each choice leads to. And here today, the choice is represented to each of us in dealing with an inescapable topic of life, that of trials. Again, James doesn't say if, he doesn't say should you, or maybe if it happens, he says when. He says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Count it all joy, he says. And he doesn't just give, again, the exhortation and leave it there. He's kind enough to tell us why we should do so, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. That's a good thing. That's maturing. That's strength. That's toughness. That's moving forward and being ready for what God has next, which is probably another trial that he allows to come in to grow you to be able to move forward. But I digress. And furthermore, he says, let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect to complete, lacking nothing. That's the honest truth. 
The choice for the reader and the choice for the church today, us as the church, is whether or not we look to that and accept it as true, which we should because it's the Bible, and if we're going to choose the right way, which is how the Bible exhorts us. And the Bible exhorts us to count it all joy when we fall into various trials. And that is the choice that we have to either count it joy, to either count it all joy and allow the Lord to lead us and to grow us and that we are ready on the other side to be complete and ready for what's next or to not. And as we don't, to not expect what James says will happen if we do to happen. And nowhere within James talking about this, did you notice this? Nowhere within this does he ever say that if you choose not to count it all joy, that the trial just goes away. Like, did you notice that? Like, there's no like indication like count it all joy, but if you don't, well, the trial stops. The trial happens regardless. The trial and the hard, that's inevitable. That's inevitable because of the fallen world that we live in. That's inevitable because of what the Lord wants to do in our life and how he wants to grow us and lead us. What is the choice is whether or not we're gonna lean and grow or just, sit in it and let it happen around us and not grow and probably make the trial go on longer. The choice, my friends, is for us to see here, presented to us today, to count it all joy when we fall into various trials, knowing that we can count it joy and knowing that in counting it joy, knowing that it's going to cause us and necessitate us leaning into the Lord, that that will grow us as people of God, ready to continue to walk forward in this life. And so the choice is clear. It should be clear to us today. And again, James, as the Bible, doesn't negate the hard within the trial. Nor should we. Nor should we pretend that we're counting it all joy because, you know, it's really not that bad. No, it's okay. It is okay, understand, to be honest with the Lord, to be honest with the body of Christ who God has given to us to support and to build one another up. It is okay. It is appropriate to, to realize that life is hard and to not negate the hard that is represented in this room in so many ways. It is represented in the lives that we have here. And I love that James, he doesn't like point out different like issues or different trials. He's not like, hey, count it all joy when you go through financial issues. Count it all joy when you go through marriage issues. Hey, count it all joy when you're dealing with your singleness and it's hard. Hey, count it all joy when you're dealing with parenting or you're dealing with your parents or dealing with it. Like he doesn't do that because what would happen is we would count it joy in those and like really trying to dig in with that and everything else would just be like, ah, I can do what I want. No, he's like, hey, whatever it is, no matter how hard it is, no matter how big it is, no matter what you're facing, count it all joy and let the Lord grow you. Count it joy and choose to do as the Bible instructs us to do. And so the choice, friends, is ours. And the choice is presented in the word of God for us to count it all joy when we fall into various trials, knowing again that the testing of our faith produces within us patience. And that patience produced in us makes us complete, makes us ready, makes us mature in Christ. And so, it's up to us to choose. And it is as simple as that, as will much of the book of James be. And it is the prayer, no doubt of James as he wrote this, and no doubt of many who read it. And I, it's my prayer as, 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 as we study this book, and I pray that you would pray the same thing. That we would see the exhortations, we would see the choices presented. And it starts with trials today, so this is what your choice is today. This is what our choice is today on whether or not we will do what the Bible calls us to and it is as simple as that. You either are or you aren't. If you are, you're going to grow. If you're not, you won't. If you are, you will see the Lord grow. You will see the Lord move you and walk you through this life. And it will be hard. James is honest about that. I'll be honest with you too. I would be a liar to say that, hey, follow Jesus and everything's going to be great. It's going to be hard at times. You're blessed because we know where we stand, but it is still hard. However, on the other side of the hard, there is growth, there is maturity, and there is more depth in the relationship with the Lord. So the question is, well, what will you choose? What are you choosing right now within the trial that perhaps you're in right now? And again, that's not to negate the heart. We as the body of Christ, God's kindness is giving us one another to be able to bear and be with one another in the heart. And so understand that we're not to negate the heart. We are to encourage in the heart and encourage to count it all joy as we're walking in the trials that we're walking in, whatever that may look like for you. And again, as unique as we are for one another, so too are the trials that we face. And God works it out that way. 
And he works it out that way because as the trial is unique to us, so we grow uniquely ready to be used by the God of the universe who wants to use us in unique ways. And so today, what are you choosing? What will you choose in the future trials? And that decision needs to be made every single day, even before the trial happens. Perhaps right now you're like, there's no trials in my life. Okay, okay, well, guess what? It's going to happen. I'm just here to tell you that because James says it will happen. And so today is a day to say, Lord, help me to count it joy. Help me, Lord, to positionally realize where I am in you and be ready for what is ahead, knowing that a day will come that will be hard. God, help me to stand in joy now, in the joy that you have for me and can build into me and can lead me in. The choice is ours, friends. And the choice is ours every single day. And it starts today as we study the book of James. It starts with trials because James wants to let us know that he means business and he wants to let us know he's going to be honest. But as hard as life may be, Jesus again is with us. And Jesus again wants to lead us. And as we belong to him, we again can count it joy and can allow him to grow us and see growth and maturity in our lives. And I pray that we would. It starts with trials. I pray that we would continue to do that as we study the book of James and that we as a church would see ourselves grow. Let's pray.